Tonight we're going to be considering Christ restoring the sight of a blind man. And it's, uh, Mark is the only one that records this particular <coughs> miracle, but it is a very insightful one. I want to say a few words about these miracles before we begin. <coughs> the words miracles, plural, and miracle, singular, from Genesis to Malachi are mentioned five times. I'm going to take some of the other versions, like the NIV, it is 11 times. They occur 32 times in Matthew through Revelation. And the NIV uses the word miraculous as in miraculous signs, 31 times. Now, what is the significance of all this? Well, with the appearance of Jesus, there was more divine intervention and involvement with humanity. Now there were, there were things of a miraculous nature that happened that weren't called miracles, like the ten plagues of Egypt, you know, things of this sort, the, the flood. But they were more a judgment, they were more of a judgment, the ground opening up and, and swallowing Korah and his friends, or the serpent, fiery serpents that came in, or the plagues that fell. Uh, there, so there were things of the supernatural uh, nature that happened, but quite a few of them were judgments instead of blessings. But when Jesus came, his miracles were not judgmental in nature. Now, they could have, they could have been. He could have struck people blind, and this sort of thing. And, uh, and later, some of his apostles, they, they did. They did things like this. But Christ, he introduced an era, a new kind of era, an era where, where God was going to become involved with humanity by intervening in humanity in human affairs and altering the course of events. So it's quite a, quite a thing to behold. Mm -hmm. It was like a prelude to the day of salvation. The day of salvation isn't a day in which we all do differently. Simply. It's an era in which God and man are joined together. As he said, I will be their God and they shall be my people. See, it's a different kind of an era and Jesus introduced it in his miracles. He, he did not accent law keeping. Interesting, isn't it? He didn't accent law keeping. He accented God becoming involved in humanity and man having faith in God. Now this, uh, this incident is found in Mark the 8th chapter, verses 22 through 26. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands upon his eyes and made him look up and he was restored and saw every man plainly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell it to any in the town. Oh, quite, a, quite an interesting uh, occurrence. This was a town where Jesus had done many mighty works, incidentally. <coughs> now, let's look briefly at the background of this. I have a purpose for doing this, that, to show that Christ's life was wrapped up in serving God. He was, a, he was not what men would call a well-rounded person. He was wholly devoted to the Lord. Mm -hmm. I've heard people have to get a well-rounded life where you have a little of this and a little of that and a little of the other, and the world that way will not get any idea that you're really godly. Mm -hmm. Or maybe think you're one of them. That's really what they mean when they say this, isn't it? This was before this, he fed the, the 4,000 in the first few verses of Mark 8. This is one of the backgrounds. Fed the 4,000. After he had fed them, he had been in the parts of Del Manutha on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. He went over to that region. Mark 8, 10 tells you that. Straightway he entered a ship. This is after he fed the 4,000. He entered into a ship with his disciples and came into the parts of Del Manutha. And when he came into that area, the Pharisees came to him and tempted him. 
Here's what they said. They were seeking of him a sign from heaven. Remember, he just fed the four, just fed the four thousand. They tempted him seeking a sign from heaven. See, there are people that have seen great things that God has done among people, but they want like some kind of a personal confirmation that Jesus is real. If you'll just do this, if you'll just make my car start. Yeah, that's what it got in today. Is there are people who think like this? Yeah. You just fix my furnace, mm -hmm. or whatever. But the Lord, uh, He replied, replied to them. He sighed deeply in His spirit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this had an effect upon Jesus, and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given to this generation. I'm not going to give this. See, there's two different kinds of generations. This was the devil's generation. Mm -hmm. Children of the devil. He said, I'm not going to give a sign. I'm not going to give proof to you that I'm from God. There are some people God won't prove this to. He just will not do it. He'll not do it to make the, to try and convince them that he is who he says he is. And Jesus said, I'm not going to give a sign to this kind of generation. Well, after this confrontation, he got in the ship and he headed back on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. He left them. Farewell to the Pharisees. Must have been a pleasant departure. And entering into a ship, he departed to the other side. Now, the scriptures tell us in the root here, that the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. There's about 13 of them, you know, all total, maybe more. And uh, he, Jesus charged, he surveyed the situation, and he said, uh, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it's because we brought no bread. Mm -hmm. Remember now, they just fed the, just fed the four thousand. And Jesus, when he knew it, he said unto them, Why reason ye because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not, neither understand? Have ye your heart yet hardened? It's how Jesus talks to people with foolish questions. It's good to know this. He said, There's kind of a Jesus that is taught among people that. He understands your stupidity. He doesn't really bother him. Well, it does really bother him. Yes. Yes. It does really bother him that someone could be in his presence uh -huh. and think so crooked. Uh -huh. It does. That's why he answered this way. Having eyes, see ye not? Having ears, hear ye not? And do you not remember? When I break the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They said, Twelve. And when the seven among the when the seven among the four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They said seven. Well that would have, that would have been a hundred bread, but an A plus. In any in any elementary, yeah. high school, college, or postgraduate, that would have been an A plus. Yeah. Huh? This is the truth. It's been an A plus. He said unto them, How is it you do not understand? This is on the way. And then finally they said, ah, it's the doctrine of the Pharisees. That's what he's talking about. See, the doctrine of the Pharisees, they taught in such a way it corrupted your thinking. Mm -hmm. Most of us have had a, uh, similar experiences. Now, if you look at all these incidents here, <clears throat> Christ's life was totally wrapped up in serving God. Mm -hmm. This is how he thought. This is how he talked. This is what he watched. This is how he reasoned with his disciples. Amen. When he talked to them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Uh -huh. He wasn't, make sure you always have enough bread when we sail across the sea. See, Jesus didn't even think on that plane. Uh -huh. He's on another plane entirely. Uh -huh. And his dealings with the disciples were never just purely mundane. They never had a discussion about the beautiful sunset. Although I don't question there was any. Or maybe the beautiful sunrise. Or maybe... Maybe if he looked at the lilies of the field, he didn't say, oh, look at those flowers. He'd say, oh, look at those flowers. They don't spin their toil, and look how God is clothed. See, that's how he talked. Amen. His uh, total focus yes. was on the Lord, and he is the ideal man. Yes, amen. We acknowledge that uh, 
We come short in this area, but, but we can target to come up Amen. higher. Yes. After the circumstances, he's, he gets to the ship, he comes back into Galilee, and he goes into the city of Bethsaida. The 22nd verse said that he went into Beth Bethsaida. Bethsaida was a town in Galilee. You might be interested to know that Peter, Andrew, and Philip were from this town. John 1.44 tells us that. that that's, that's to me, that is... <laughs> Philip was of Bethsaida in the city of Andrew and Peter. So he got 25% of the apostles are from this city. And it was not a nice city. Yeah. It was like Jesus coming out of Nazareth. He said, Peter and Andrew were brothers, and Philip coming out of Bethsaida were like Jesus coming out of Nazareth. It was a, it was a bad city. Jesus had fed the 5,000 near this city. The scriptures uh, tell us this in Luke 9.10. The apostles, when they were returned, told him all that they had done, and he took them and went aside privately into a desert place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. And then that following day, then he fed the 5,000 there. So, see, things that happened near this city. What we're going to, what's going to be said about this city shouldn't have been said if people had paid attention to what was going on. That's right. But Jesus can visit some places, and it does not make a difference really want to see this. The only difference would be made, it would bring out what they weren't. Yes, amen. That would be the only. Jesus did rebuke this city, along with some others in that region of Galilee. Here's how the Word of God says it. Matthew 11:20. 20. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Right. Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Here's Luke's comment on this, Luke 10, 13. Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which had been done in you, they would have had a great while ago repentance, sitting in sackcloth and ashes, but... It shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. Mm -hmm. now, this is the city he's, <laughs> he's come to here. In fact, this is the work he's going to work here is one of the works that didn't induce repentance. Now, I notice you might have thought he would have said, Woe is unto you because you didn't believe. Mm -hmm. you, might, you might think that he would have said that. Or, Woe is unto you because you didn't receive me. I, mean, I thought that he... I'd have said that. But instead he said, repented not, which tells you this was they were at a high level of expressing iniquity. This city, there's a lot of sin in it. Mm -hmm. And the presence of Jesus did not move them to repent. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus pronounced a woe to it because it did. Well, you know, you think about cities like our fair city. There's a lot of iniquity in our city. Do you think God winks at it? Do you think he hasn't noticed it? Do you think that the fact that there's been a lot said about Jesus in this area, that this hasn't been registered in the tablets of heaven, God doesn't know about it? Woe to them because they didn't repent. See, this confirms to us that miracles don't change people. Uh -huh. right? Amen. It says most, most of his mighty works were done in this region. Mm -hmm. And yet he upbraided them because they didn't repent. See, people will. People have the something in people that like to know, see Jesus do something, like to see a, a, a something supernatural. Mm -hmm. But they're not. They don't, as they say, some places cotton to repenting. They don't repent. Well, let me tell you, Jesus is not impressed by spectators. He's not impressed by people just to come to see what he does and this sort of thing. He wants to turn people Amen. from their sin. Amen. Now, when he's in Bethsaida, they they brought to him a blind man. We don't know who the they were, but it was someone who knew Jesus could do something about the situation. They brought a blind man to him, and it says they be, they besought him to touch him. They must have thought, well, this is the way this is the way it done. One time, they the parent the mothers brought their children to Jesus that he might touch them, and he did indeed do do this many times. So they, were, they knew they knew something about Jesus that could alter mm -hmm. this situation. I will tell you that I do not believe there is this general awareness 
among religious people today that Jesus is really able to do something. Yes. There seems to be too much reliance upon uh, self-help and procedures and rules and things like this. There doesn't seem to be an awareness that Jesus can really do something, that, that his touch make, can make a difference. Well, it, that, that was a condition that existed among these people of Bethsaida. Now this matter of bringing someone to Jesus that, <coughs> that he might touch them, this is, you might liken this to intercessions, bringing people to Christ. This is a good practice to bring people to Christ in some form. One place uh, Paul said to Timothy, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions be made for all men. That's, that's a, a spiritual way of saying bring them to Jesus. Present people to them. You know people that are just in as bad shape and worse than this blind man here. You know people that really need to be brought to Christ. Yeah, I encourage you to do it. Bring it. Bring it to Amen. him. Beseech him about them. There are several places in Scripture where it said that people brought others to Jesus. They, they didn't seem to be aware of any inconvenience in doing so. We know one time four men carried a man on a pallet, toted him, walked up some stairs, let him down through a roof. <laughs> We know a lot of this happened. Let me give you a couple of instances of this. Matthew 4, 24. <laughs> His fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people. Well, that's quite a, it's quite a statement. What would happen, you suppose, if that happened in, in Joplin? That all of a sudden they brought all sick people. Well, maybe something would happen. Huh? Maybe the trouble is that they have a brought the people. Maybe that's part of the problem. Again in Matthew 8, 16, when even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with demons or devils. Matthew 9, 2, they brought unto him a man sick of palsy. Matthew 9, 32, when they went out, behold, they brought him a dumb man possessed with the devil. And as you read this over and over in the Gospels, that people were persuaded enough of Christ to bring somebody to him. Maybe you are, maybe time to time you may, may make a prayer request among God's people and this there's nothing wrong with this understand you may say well I pray for so and so I've been witnessing to so and so and, and pray for them please and this there's nothing wrong with this this is good but you you should you should become acquainted with bringing them yourself to Jesus yeah. too you must say you must use this twofold mm -hmm. that you yourself do what you can to bring them like the centurion it brought his servant, so to speak, to Christ's attention, or Jairus, it brought his, his daughters to Jesus' attention. See, this, they did it personally, too. This is, I would encourage you to do this and not to be overcome with the difficulties that people have and the situation that they're in, not to be overcome by it, but to have the faith to bring them, bring them to Jesus. Several people did this. And so they bring this to this blind man to Jesus, and... Uh, First thing Jesus does, he takes him by the hand and leads him out of town. That's the first thing he does. There are some people now that they've got to get out of town before they can be helped. They brought him to Jesus while he was in the town, but Jesus took him by the hand and led him out of the town. How far he led, we don't know. But uh, you know, before Israel could really taste of the Lord, they had to be led out of Egypt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, led, he led them out. Uh -huh. by, in fact, he says by the hand he led them out too. He led them out of Egypt before they really tasted of the Lord. They were exempt from the plagues, you know, and things like this. But when they started receiving something from the Lord, uh -huh. that's after they were out of Egypt. Yeah. You, you know this, don't you? That's after they were out of Egypt. That's right, amen. Then they've been re receiving and of course the scriptures tell us very soberly, Come ye out from among them. Be ye separate, saith the Lord, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. And Hebrews admonishes, let's go to him without the camp. Out. Let's get out where Jesus is. Jesus is separate from, well, let's speak in today's language, he's separate from institutions. Yeah. He's separate from them. And so at some point, you, he has to become personal enough that you leave all of the machinery, religious machinery that's all around us and you have to get outside where he it's just you and him mm -hmm. not in the clutter of the city. There's some places Jesus just doesn't work in these places but Jesus didn't say I'm sorry 
I can do no mighty work here. See, he didn't say this. Instead, he took the man by the hand, mm -hmm. led him out. Now, there were other blind men, and he's going to heal this blind man. There, there were other blind men Jesus healed, but he didn't do it by a, a standard procedure. <clears throat> Matthew 20, 34, <coughs> pictures two blind men called out for Jesus, and he said he touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight. But that, uh, that's not what he's going to do this time. And Matthew 21, 14 says the blind and lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. See, that's, that's not going to be the case here. You might think, well, if you're going to be blind, you have to go to the temple to be healed. This is how a regimentarian would think. Matthew 10, 51, Jesus answered, said unto them, What wilt thou that I do unto thee? This is Bartimaeus. The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And he said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. See, you might think that it's a standard way. And then there was this infamous account in John 9 where when Jesus had spoken to a blind man, he spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. In this case, Jesus didn't say it, and, and you'll, be, you'll receive your sight. <laughs> you notice he didn't say that. Go wash the pool of Siloam and you'll be able to see. This man had to have faith to believe what I do with Jesus says to do and then something's going to happen. So that was the method methodology there. Now I'm sure that there would be people that say, well, this is the way you have to make clay out of spittle and put it on your eye and then you have to wash in a holy pool. There might be people think something like this, but what I'm showing here, Jesus didn't use a standard routine to heal the uh, blind man. Divine workings can be very unusual. Now, now, the thing about this is once you realize this, you, you don't look for standard-like replies from God. He doesn't react like this sometimes. Let me give you some examples of non-standard things that, uh, that he did. Now, one occasion in Exodus 15, 25, there were some waters that were very bitter. People couldn't drink from them. And the scripture says that Moses cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree which he had cast into the waters, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. So that was a kind of unusual thing. The waters are bitter poison. We'd, bitter, we'd say poison. <laughs> they couldn't kill you if you drink it. So if you cut that tree down and throw it in the water. Well, see, if you tried to do that every time you found a pool of stagnant water or something else, like I'm sorry, dear Jesus. He asked you to do some unusual things once in a while. Here's another. Exodus 17, 6, that were without water again. He said, Behold, God said to Moses, I'll stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it. So this, you know, I could almost see people out there beating on a rock, trying to get water out. So that, that doesn't make sense to do something like that. But see, God... If you're going to trust God, He may ask you to do some very unusual <laughs> unusual things that you couldn't really explain to anybody else mm -hmm. at all. Another instance was uh, found in 2 Kings 6, 6. The young man was, <laughs> the, uh, the ch sons of the prophets had outgrown where they were at. They had to build a new, build new structures. And uh, as one man was cutting down trees, they, he had a borrowed axe, and the axe head flew off in the water. Now, now, an insensitive person would have thought nothing of it and said, oh, well, whatever it must be, it must be. But see, this man uh, came to the prophet and told him about this. And here's what, what the prophet uh, Elisha said. Man of God said, where fell it? Well, <laughs> an inattentive young man would have said, well, I don't know. I know. It just, just disappeared off the handle. And I, don't, I don't know. But this, he knew where it fell. And he showed him the place, and, and he cut down a stick. Cut a stick out and cast it in there, and then the axe head floated up to the top. It was iron. Well, see, that's kind of a... <laughs> would you have thought to do something like that? You'd probably send divers in there. These people would probably send divers in there with snorkeling in there and try and, try and find that axe head. I'm showing here that, that Jesus isn't all locked up in things that are, are normal. He'll sometimes call upon you to do something, and if you don't have faith, it just sounds stupid to do it. 
Like if you just confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins. See, that won't make sense to some people. That's right. But when it does make sense to you, it's a blessed thing. Amen. And there was another instance in 2 Kings, the 20th chapter, 2nd chapter, verse 20, where they had poison waters again, and what are we going to do with them? And they uh, asked Elisha, and here's what he said, bring me a new cruise, new, new uh, pitcher, we would call pitcher, put salt therein, and they brought it to him. He went forth into the spring of waters and cast the salt in there, and thus said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. Then the waters were healed. Well, see, <laughs> you, I'm sure you, there were people maybe that tried that. To do that, say, we know. This is what happens. When you take a fresh vessel, put salt in it, and throw it in the fountain head of the waters, it'll, he did something unusual. Very unusual. Or if you think God doesn't ask you to do unusual things, then you have to kind of hear the testimony of Ezekiel. <laughs> Some of these prophets, I tell you, I glory in them. Here's what God said to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 4.4, 4, Lie thou upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity, as you'll be thinking about their sin all the time. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, and here's how long he had to lay on his left side, 390 days. So shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, as we finish these 390, Turn over now, lag in on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. For I have appointed thee each day for a year. <laughs> so you want to serve God, do you? You, you? you want to serve God? Do you really want to serve God? You ask yourself the question, what if he asked you to lay on your left side for 390 days, and then turn over and lay on your right, left, right side for 40 days? Do you want to serve God? People want to serve God, God. <laughs> He finds out whether you can go through a wilderness or not, or whether you can live on the back side of the desert for 40 years or not. God, uh, well, he just uh, works in this sort of a manner. What about Isaiah? Let's call Isaiah the witness stand. Has God ever asked you to do something that's unusual? At the time, this is Isaiah 20, verse 2, at the same time spake the Lord... By Isaiah the son of Amos saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins, and put off the shoe from thy feet. And he did so walking naked and barefoot. How long was that? And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and Ethiopia. This is this is God. This is God. You want to serve God? Don't think that he's always going to make you famous. Mm. Or that he's going to always ask you reasonable things to do. Uh -huh. In the case of the blind man, he's going to have to take him outside the city <clears throat> to do anything. So he took him outside the city <laughs> and he, he spit on his eyes. Would you, uh, this... <laughs> The, uh, the people who say that they can do great signs and wonders today and to their own master they stand or fall, but I've never seen them use this particular procedure. The ACLU would probably sue them if they did something like this. He spit on his eyes. Well, this tells me there's more power in Jesus' saliva than there is in everything man has. Yes. A very demeaning thing. How are you going to brag about this? Jesus spit in my eye. <laughs> well, after he did this, and he touched his spit on his eyes, and he touched him. And then Jesus asked him, do you, do you see anything? Can you see anything? Because that is the important thing. Can you, this would be a good procedure when you baptize someone. When you bring them up and say, can you see anything? Is anything clear to you? And the man said, well, I can't, it looks like trees walking. I can't see clearly. I just, I can kind of make a rough outline of some subjects out there. There's some motion by. 
I can't, he told him the truth. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, well, that's, that's all right. That's all right, Jesus. At least I can see something. It may not be perfect, but at least I can see something. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll be able to live with this. Oh, he had to tell him the truth. I can't see clearly. You'd be surprised how many people their problems would be resolved if they go to Jesus and say, I can't see clearly. I don't have a good understanding. I get confused too easy. Uh -huh. So Jesus uh, touched him the second time, and his sight was restored, and he saw every man clearly. <clears throat> now this is, of course, the only account where Jesus, uh, on the surface, almost failed. Every other healing he had, it was like instant, immediately. But see, this was a little bit different here. So you shouldn't expect like immediate results all the time either. Mm -hmm. They may very well be immediately or straightway, as the scripture would say. But then there may be a case like this. And if, if there is a case like this, you don't say, well, Jesus, I'm healed. I just have the symptoms. Huh? You don't say something like this to Jesus. So I still have some lingering symptoms, but maybe they'll, no, no, you got to tell them the truth mm -hmm. about what it is. It wasn't that Jesus lacked power. That's right. That wasn't that wasn't the point. It was this this environment of unbelief. There was there were thing uh, four opposing forces here, but Jesus is fully adequate to this. But he's, he's teaching us something yeah. that there are situations that uh, we're too close. People are just too close to the citadels of unbelief. Mm -hmm. And so things are a little slower happening sometimes in those. But if you're honest with Jesus, they will, they will happen. Some can only perceive the general outline of the truth. They just kind of see Jesus loves Jesus loves me. I can see that, but I can't I can't really see how plain it is that he loved me and gave himself for me, or that he ever lives to make intercession for me. I, I can't see that, but I gotta just see the rough outline. Well, you gotta, you gotta fess up to this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's more to see than this. Yeah. And you confess this to the Lord; He'll give the second touch. It, it'll happen. There is such a thing as a second touch. You can't systematize it. Mm -hmm. But there's a second touch, like the day dawning and the day star rising in your heart. That when everything becomes clearer, yeah. see, that's like a, like a second touch. But wherever that's happened, people have been honest. Mm -hmm. with the Lord. Everything was plain. And that's a target. That's a target to be able to see everything plain yes. or clearly, as the Scripture says. After that, he put his hands upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. See, that's the, that's the target. Clear sight and vision. Now, Jesus tells them quite a, gives them two commands. They're very, very... Uh, very arresting. Say, so go to your house now. Don't go into town. Don't go into town. But you know, in the case of the gathering demoniac, he sent him back into town. But this is a different circumstance. Jesus hadn't been working a lot of great wonders in Gadara in the land of the Gergesenes or the land of the Gadarenes. He hadn't been doing a lot of mighty works over there. He'd been doing a lot of mighty works here in Galilee, and he just people just turned him off. Mm -hmm. They didn't believe. They said, don't go into town. Don't put this pearl of those swine in there. Mm -hmm. And if you're someplace and you see someone in the town, so don't tell them to anybody from the town. If he's from the town and you come across him, don't, don't tell him. Now, you can't view this just as a strict law. You've got to see this as this town had like a, had a drawing... A downward pull right. on the human spirit, and people from the town, or <coughs> they had a kind of a downward pull. There's some, there's some people really you gotta really stay away from. Uh -huh. right. Amen. Uh, you really have to do this, uh -huh. particularly when you're young in Christ, or the things aren't really clear to you, or just maybe you're just freshly awakened to Christ. You see some things, but they're just in the process of learning. You gotta you gotta be careful where you go and who you talk. To. Uh huh. You really do. Now, in this uh, in this picture, he lived out something the disciples had just experienced. You remember they came on the boat. He said, uh, "Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and uh, and the leaven of Herod." 
he's a, he's a politician. Beware of the religious and the political. <laughs> Watch out, they both have their way of thinking. Yeah. The professional religious people have a certain direction, certain way they think. Professional politicians have a way they think. Watch out, it's infectious. Yeah. You can get to thinking like a Babylonian or thinking like a politician. You can think like they do. Watch. And then Jesus said, uh, they said, we, because it's, they haven't forgotten bread. They didn't see clearly. See, they hadn't seen things clearly. So he and this blind man, I'm confident that they thought about this. That he was in, uh, his physical situation was exactly like their spiritual condition. They'd been with Jesus. They'd experienced the work of Jesus, but they hadn't seen clearly. It was like foggy. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of people, I was in this state myself, they just really don't know what it's all about. They just know it's, it's good and there's blessings to be had and God loves me and I, I love God, I think, and I want to do good. And, but see, you really don't, you can't just stay in that kind of state. You, you've got to be where things are clear to you. And you mm -hmm. can see clear because you can't have confidence if you're not clear. Yes, amen. How would you, if, you're, if this man had left with his vision, seeing men as trees walking, who would have believed him? And he said, the Lord, praise God, the Lord healed me. And I just can't recognize you, that's all. I got to step a little closer so I can see clearly. Who, what kind of testimony is that? Huh? There are people that have testimonies like this. The Lord's done a great thing, except as I can't really prove it to you, but he... Well, this man, when he left, he could prove it. Mm -hmm. He could see how far off mm -hmm. after this. And he could recognize things a way off. So it's a picture of this slowness of heart of the disciples. Here's what he said to them, you remember. Uh, Perceive ye not yet. What a word that is. Perceive ye not yet. Yet neither understand. Have ye your heart still hardened? Has he ever said that to you? Said you to your hearts, is your heart still hard? Jesus kind of trying to get to break through the crust of flesh, you know. Said, preachers and teachers have to tell people this is the way Jesus is. Jim, I said, you still, goodness sake, I have to talk to you like you're a little infant? Says, your heart still hard, is it? Can't you see clearly yet? He's willing to correct the situation. Yeah. See, you got you got to shell it on the corn with it. Say, well... I just see men like trees walking. I can't really distinguish between something that's alive and has a personality and something that's not. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't tell. And I do think we should take seriously Christ's admonition. Now, don't go into the town. Don't, don't go where I've been rejected. Mm -hmm. that, he, he doesn't mean that when you committed a sin if you journeyed through Bethsaida, because he went into Bethsaida. Mm -hmm. That isn't what he meant. What he meant was don't, don't, don't make this like a place you get accustomed with. If I've been rejected, you got no business staying there. If I'm not there, what in the world are you doing there? Uh -huh. See, that's, what, that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. So if you wondered about how long should I stay at a dead church, or how long should I stay with dead relatives, or whatever, uh -huh. well, they're, they're going to have to come a time when you got to pull out. Yeah. Now there's some places that must be left if you're going to experience a work from God. I can distinctly remember as a young young man, my mid mid twenties, when I had experienced an awful lot of disappointment from the religious world, and it sort of beat me down. And I had to I, I viewed myself as having to work for a living. <laughs> it sounds foolish now, but it was it was quite a transition for me to make. And I remember when it finally dawned on me, I'm going to work for Jesus. I'm going to forget about the name on the check that I got. There's a name on there. I'm going to, I'm going to just say God and Christ. That's what I'm going to work for. And when that came, on my whole, my whole life altered. My whole life altered. That's when something, the Word of Truth, I began to publish the Word of Truth, and a lot of the things opened up that I looked at totally impossible. But when I decided. I wanted to see clearly. Uh -huh. There are also lingering evil influences that require extensive divine activity. There's some things in a person's life that Jesus <coughs> has to do a double, sort of a double work, like this man's blindness. <coughs> Again, 
It's not that there's any deficiency in Jesus. These, these, these things, but see, the accent isn't placed there's no deficiency in Jesus. The accent is there are some things that are exceedingly difficult to conquer yeah. and to overcome. Mm -hmm. But if you stick with Jesus and you yeah. tell him the truth and you do what he says, you'll come out the victor. Amen. You will. Don't be naive about life. Don't think things are as simple as 10 people will have you believe. They are not. And when you can't see plainly, tell him you can't see plainly. Do like David did. Give me understanding. He says that five times in Psalm 119. Give me understanding. What was he saying? I can't see plainly. Uh -huh. When I read your word, I can tell there's more here than I'm seeing. Tell it to him. And the testimony of divine works are to be given wisely. There are some places that have already rejected Christ and you tell him what wonderful things you have done for you may not be the Thing that turns them around. So be discreet about who you who you tell these things to. Make sure you tell them to somebody, but make be sure the right people. Well, Jesus restores the blind man, and we don't we don't know his name. <laughs> we don't we don't know anything about him except that there were people who knew he was blind. They knew who Jesus was. They brought him to Jesus, and they left him with Jesus. And Jesus took it from there. And uh, before the day was over. The man was seeing everything plainly. I thank God for for that account. But